Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. In today's video, we'll have an exploration of polycythemia vera, a neoplastic clonal disorder within the myeloproliferative category. Join me as we unravel the intricate tapestry of its pathogenesis, exploring the very essence of this condition. Polycythemia vera, or PV, is characterized by a clonal disorder, a condition where a group of cells originates from a single, abnormal precursor cell. In PV, the bone marrow paints a picture of panmyelosis, a landscape where various blood cell types proliferate uncontrollably. This overgrowth extends to the peripheral blood, leading to an increase in the number of erythrocytes, granulocytes, and platelets. An all-too-common occurrence is splenomegaly, where the spleen enlarges due to the overproduction of these blood components. The tale of PV starts at the very beginning, with a hematopoietic stem cell, the origin of all blood cells. It's from this point that the neoplastic journey unfolds. Scientific investigations have illuminated the clonal nature of PV. X-length restriction fragment length DNA polymorphisms have provided insights, revealing a telltale sign of monoclonal X chromosome inactivation across all blood cells. But how does PV's story unfold on a cellular level? Let's dive into the pathogenic mechanism that sets the stage for this condition. Our journey begins with erythropoietin hypersensitivity, a phenomenon where clonal stem cells in PV display an extraordinary response to erythropoietin, a growth factor responsible for cell proliferation. In the laboratory, even low levels of erythropoietin are sufficient to stimulate the growth of erythroid progenitor cells. This heightened sensitivity becomes a key characteristic of PV. What's intriguing is that both hypersensitive and normosensitive erythroid colony-forming units coexist, contributing to the complexity of PV's progression. The tale takes a significant turn as we delve into clinical progression and the discovery of the JAK2V617F mutation, a mutation discovered in 90-97% PV patients. This mutation is an acquired alteration that occurs within hematopoietic stem cells, the precursors of all blood cells. The mutation's consequences are profound it leads to the constitutive activation of erythropoietic signaling, like a persistent signal that drives cellular responses. Zooming in on the mutation itself, it involves a change from guanine to thymine in the JAK2 gene's exon 14. This seemingly small alteration causes a cascade of effects. This mutation results in an amino acid change at position 617, from valine to phenylalanine. This shift disrupts the normal inhibition of kinase activity, leading to constant activation. As the story unfolds, we encounter erythropoietin receptor activation, a key moment in the signaling process. Erythropoietin, released by the kidneys, binds to receptors on erythroid precursor cells. This binding triggers receptor dimerization, a union that's crucial for cellular communication. This dimerization sets the stage for JAK2 activation, a process that involves phosphorylation and conformational change. The phosphorylated JAK2, in turn, activates STAT proteins proteins that act as transcription factors, orchestrating cellular processes. In PV, active JAK2 translates to a continuous activation of signaling pathways, creating a web of cellular responses. The constitutive tyrosine kinase activity triggers the phosphorylation of STAT proteins, even bypassing the need for erythropoietin binding, a relentless cycle of cellular communication. What's remarkable is that JAK2 mutated stem cells exhibit a resilience to apoptosis triggered by the absence of erythropoietin. This resistance is achieved through increased levels of the anti-apoptotic protein BCLX. As a consequence, precursor cells in PV manage to escape normal cell death, accumulating in number, a phenomenon that contributes to the overall disease picture. But the influence of the JAK2 mutation doesn't stop at cellular signaling, it extends to chromatin structure, impacting DNA methylation and gene expression. This mutation's impact varies across PV and other myeloproliferative disorders, with the variation in JAK2V617F homozygosity and heterozygosity potentially influencing disease progression. As we navigate through the intricate genetic landscape, we uncover additional mutations that play their parts in PV's journey. Around 5% of PV patients exhibit a lack of JAK2V617F mutation, suggesting a familial predisposition and hinting at the involvement of mutations that precede it. Gain-of-function mutations in MPL, exon 10, hold a significant role, rendering receptors more sensitive to thrombopoietin, TPO, a key player in platelet production. Some MPL mutations even activate receptors independently of TPO binding, further complicating the signaling landscape. 
These MPL mutations are detected in 15% of ET and PMF patients who lack the JAK2V617F mutation, adding another layer to the complexity. And then, we encounter the jak 2 exon 12 mutation, an alteration spanning amino acids 536 to 547. This mutation's gain-of-function characteristics mirror those of JAK2V617F. Exon 12 mutations, although found in only 3% of PV patients, are not associated with ET or PMF, emphasizing the distinct nature of these genetic events. However, the role of these mutations as standalone factors might not be enough to drive the development of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Enter the germline haplotype block, a genetic configuration that heightens susceptibility to JAK2 mutations, and then, we encounter adapter protein LNK mutations, SH2B3, a regulatory element that downregulates the JAK stat signaling pathway. The impact of LNK mutations is profound, leading to an increased proliferation of erythrocytes and thrombocytes. Remarkably, when combined with JAK2V617F or MPLW515L mutations, LNK mutations amplify their effects, shaping the course of the disease. Our journey continues with the spotlight on the JAK2 mutation's impact on hematopoietic stem cells, those vital precursors to all blood cells. Interestingly, in the early stages of this journey, the JAK2V617F allele burden within these stem cells is found to be lower at diagnosis. This observation hints at a limited growth advantage conferred by the JAK2V617F mutation to hematopoietic stem cells, a factor that adds complexity to the story. Moving forward, our narrative embraces the germline haplotype block, a genetic arrangement that heightens susceptibility to MPNs, particularly in connection with JAK2 mutations. This genetic configuration also introduces us to LNK mutations, which downregulate the JAK stat pathway. This intricate interaction has implications in the development of MPNs. When these LNK mutations combine with other genetic alterations, the effects are amplified, influencing the phenotypes of PV and essential thrombocythemia. Our narrative takes yet another intriguing turn as we explore somatic mutations in genes responsible for DNA methylation control, a process that regulates gene expression. Notable genes in this landscape include TET2, IDH1, and IDH2, each holding keys to the delicate balance of genetic control. TET2, a frequent player in myeloid disorders, including MPNs, showcases its role in DNA methylation. TET2 mutations lead to hypermethylation, a phenomenon where genes are inactivated. TET2's role becomes even more fascinating as it converts 5-methylcytosine, 5-MC, to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, 5-HMC, potentially participating in DNA demethylation processes. TET2's influence extends beyond its direct effects. It often precedes JAK2 mutations and is found in CD34 plus hematopoietic stem cells, a duo that might create a predisposition for JAK2 mutations. The frequency of TET2 mutations varies across MPNs, with about 9.8% to 16% in PV, 4.4% to 5% in ET, and 7.7% to 17% in PMF patients, underscoring its relevance in disease progression. As our story unfolds, we encounter a critical juncture, progression to blast crisis, a transformation that occurs in less than 10% of PV and ET patients. This transformation is a complex puzzle, a culmination of multiple genetic mutations that converge to push the disease into a more aggressive state. Among these mutations, TP53 and RUNX1 take on pivotal roles, orchestrating the transition from myeloproliferative neoplasms to acute myeloid leukemia. TP53, a tumor suppressor gene, produces the P53 protein, a guardian of the cell cycle and apoptosis. Loss of function TP53 mutations are linked to advanced MPNs and AML. While uncommon in MPN's chronic phase, TP53 mutations are detected in about 20% of advanced AML cases, highlighting their significance. Another player, RUNX1, produces a transcription factor vital for hematopoiesis. In post-MPN AML patients, RUNX1 mutations are found in 30% of cases, contributing to the transformation. These recent discoveries shine a light on the intricate dance of genetic mutations in the progression of MPNs, especially polycythemia vera. Alterations in DNA methylation control and regulatory pathways weave together to contribute to the complexity of disease development. Next, we have an exploration of the diagnostic journey into polycythemia vera, guided by the rigorous standards set by the World Health Organization. Diagnosis of PV isn't a mere formality, 
it requires meeting specific criteria that form the foundation of identification. To be diagnosed, one must fulfill either two major criteria and one minor criterion, or the first major criterion and two minor criteria. The first major criterion involves elevated hemoglobin levels, greater than 18.5 grams per deciliter in men and 16.5 grams per deciliter in women. The second major criterion revolves around the identification of a JAK2 mutation, such as JAK2V617F or JAK2Xon12. The minor criteria provide additional clues for diagnosis. Panmyelosis in the bone marrow, low serum erythropoietin levels, and autonomous, in vitro erythroid colony formation play their parts. There's more to consider. Increased red blood cell mass, arterial oxygen saturation of at least 92%, splenomegaly, thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, and increased leukocyte alkaline phosphatase, LAP, serum vitamin B12, or unbound vitamin B12 binding capacity contribute to the diagnostic mosaic. The presence of JAK2V617F mutation, detected in over 90% to 95% of cases, becomes a critical cornerstone in the process. Yet, challenges linger. Early diagnosis can be intricate, especially when other conditions cloud the picture. The bone marrow, a window into the blood's origin, often presents unique changes. Normoblasts may cluster, megakaryocytes can enlarge, and bone marrow sinuses may expand without fibrosis. Around 80% of patients show panmyelosis. Bone marrow may have 100% hematopoietic cellularity. A look at peripheral blood reveals seemingly normal cells, normocytic, normal chromic erythrocytes, mature granulocytes, and normal-sized, granulated platelets. Beyond the laboratory, the clinical effects emerge, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, vascular engorgement, and circulatory disturbances. With these effects come risks, increased chances of hemorrhage, tissue infarction, and thrombosis. Polycythemia varies clinical presentation, where phases, manifestations, and treatment strategies shape the landscape of patient care. Polycythemia vera unfolds in distinct phases, beginning with an independent proliferative phase that defies the body's usual regulatory mechanisms. One hallmark of PV is the consistently elevated red blood cell mass, a defining feature that sets the stage for further developments. The stable phase follows, bringing stability to the condition. However, in some patients, this phase may progress to what's known as the spent phase. In the spent phase, progressive splenomegaly or hypersplenism can emerge, creating a complex interplay of symptoms as pancytopenia and anemia with teardrop-shaped poikilocytes can be observed. This pattern is termed postpolycythemic myeloid metaplasia, similar to PMF. Peripheral WBC and RBC counts show variability. Presence of nucleated erythrocytes, immature granulocytes, and large platelets. Splenomegaly often results from extramedullary hematopoiesis. Bone marrow gets involved in this journey, with myelofibrosis developing within its core it can occupy a significant portion of bone marrow volume. Ineffective hematopoiesis can follow due to myelofibrosis. Treatment and prognosis become pivotal points in PV's narrative. Therapeutic phlebotomy to manage hematocrit levels is the preferred approach. Low-dose aspirin steps in to prevent thrombosis across all risk categories, a critical strategy for maintaining patient well-being. High-risk patients may receive hydroxyurea or other interventions, tailored to their individual profiles. On the prognosis front, the outlook is generally positive, with a median survival of 15 to 20 years for most patients. However, about 15% of patients may face the challenging possibility of progressing to acute leukemia, a risk that certain treatments might elevate. Only 1-2% to of phlebotomy-treated patients experience leukemic transformation. Risk of thrombosis and bleeding may require alkylating agents alongside phlebotomy. Some patients exhibit a temporary disease pattern similar to myelodysplasia. Transformation to acute leukemia can be challenging to classify. Enter modern JAK inhibitors, the game-changers in treatment. In a Phase II study, INCB-018424, also known as rexolitinib, showcased effectiveness in hydroxyurea intolerant patients. This inhibitor yielded impressive results, 45% achieved complete remission, 97% became phlebotomy independent, and 80% saw a reduction in spleen size. CEP-701, or lestortinib, presented a mixed bag with 83% of patients witnessing spleen size reduction. These studies highlighted not only therapeutic potential but also challenges, including common gastrointestinal events. Stay up to date with our latest videos by hitting that subscribe button and activating notifications. 
be the first to know when we release new and exciting content. Don't keep all this valuable information to yourself, share this video with your friends who might find it interesting and beneficial. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, take care and goodbye.